Mildred Eugenia Pearson. How do you spell Eugenia? E-U-G-E-N-I-A. And how do you spell Mildred? M-I-L-D-R-E-D. Okay. And Mildred, uh, well, you prefer to be called Millie, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Millie, what's your date of birth? 1927, November the 17th. And where were you born? was born right here at Melrose in the big house next door. <clears throat> one, of, one of ten children. Oh, one of ten. To Giles William Pearson. How do you spell Giles? G-I-L-E-S. Giles William Pearson. And Aletha Morgan Pearson. And how do you spell a L E T H A. A L E T H A. A L E T H A. Okay. And what was her maiden name? Morgan. Morgan. She grew up on the mountain above here, which is known as Fort Creek. I think I've seen pictures of her. Mm hmm. Leon's her half brother. Uh, Leon is your half brother? No, her, no. Her, Aletha's. No, Leon. Half brother, son. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, Millie, you currently live on Pearson Falls Road, is that correct? Yes. It's named after your family, is that correct? Yes. Um, have you ever been married? No. No. So you don't have any children, I'm, no. I'm assuming. No. Okay. Um, okay. So have, you've lived in, in the Melrose Saluda area all your life, is that correct? I was away in Washington for eight years working for the Army. So you were in the Army? I wasn't in the Army. Oh, I worked for the well, Army. You were the Army. Okay. What did you do? I was a secretary to a colonel. Okay. All right. Now we need to get a little information about you. Okay. Okay. So what's your name? Priscilla Jean Pearson. It's P R I S C I L L A. J E A N. Okay. And your date of birth? Eleven six forty two. And where were you born? Tryon, at an old St. Luke's hospital up on the hill. Okay, did you grow up in the Melrose community also? Well, I came from home from the hospital. It was during the war. When I came home from the hospital, I came here over to that house at Melrose where my grandparents lived. My father was in Baltimore at the time. Okay. And so you currently live on Pearson Falls Road as well? I lived for a while until Daddy built a house on Greenville Street, um, between Patterson Street and Greenville Street, mm -hmm. you know, the second house where pa after you turn off on Patterson Street. Right, uh-huh. A house over on the left. Okay. That All was right. the house Daddy built. All right, okay. And what are your parents' names? Well, Giles is Millie's oldest brother. Okay, so this is Giles Giles William Pearson Jr., but he's actually the set third. Okay, so the Giles William Pearson Jr. was your father? Yes. Her brother's son. Okay. And your mother's name? Dulcie Mae Gordon. Okay, spell Dulcie for me. D U L C I E. Dulcie Mae? May, M-A-E, okay. uh -huh. Gordon? Gordon. Okay, now are you, are you married? Have you been married? No. no. All right, okay. So we're just gonna jump in. Do you all have a preference of what you wanna talk about? Do you wanna talk a little bit about growing up in Saluda and what that was like, or? Well, I'd like to say that I grew up here in Melrose 
went to school in Saluda, rode the school bus for 11 years, graduated from Saluda, and the Pearson Falls was my playground when I was growing up because my father at one time owned Pearson Falls. In fact, he was the first person to buy Pearson Falls. And he found out who owned it, and he bought it from some speculators in New York who had come down here after the Civil War, the carpetbaggers, and bought up a lot of land. And he found out who owned it and got in touch with them and bought it. And he had it until the Depression came along in, what, 1929-30. And he had a little mortgage on it, and he lost it to the bank. And he was very instrumental in getting the Tryon Garden Club to, to buy it because he knew the value and the diversity of the plants and trees that were there. But anyway, when he lost it, he also lost our house. And we had to move across the valley to one of my grandfather's houses. So I was just a small child and I don't even remember moving. But I do remember moving back. And when we moved back, we used my Aunt Maggie's wagon and her mule to bring our furniture over here and we moved back into the big house. So when was that? <clears throat> well, I was probably about five, maybe years old. So about about, uh, 30, uh, her, her about 32. Oh, about 32, okay. It was, we, we got the house back after the Depression. I see. And we moved back over here. Okay. So pretty much this house has been in in your life, your the majority of your life. Oh, I was born in it, yeah. Okay. All of us were born in it except the last two children, and they were born while we lived across the valley. So I, I bet you've seen a lot of changes with the railroad from living right here, haven't you? Yeah, we grew up with the railroad. That was part of our playground, too. Oh, my goodness. Okay. And there was a... A man over that worked over there was a little office over there where they had the took care of the <clears throat> changing the rails what do you call it? What do you call it, Sarah Priscilla? Safety track? Yeah, the safety track when they t turned it over to the train over from the safety track. And he used to watch over us, and when we'd come to the end of the trestle to come over, he'd wave to us and tell us we could either come or we could stay. So it was, it was different growing up here. We spent a lot of time in the creek, a lot of time in the river. Had a tree house down here where we played. We had a good childhood. Well, tell us a little more about what it was like having Pearson Falls as your playground, because that was back when it was free and open. And oh, yeah. And you lot, could go right down to the falls. A lot more plants than there are now up there. <clears throat> Had gobs and gobs of beautiful flowers in the spring. And we'd go up and we'd even climb up on the falls and walk across it. We never got hurt. And we had one little deep hole, swimming hole, above the falls. And we could go up there and go swimming in that little hole. Learned a dog paddle up there. I bet you never worried about getting hurt, did you? No, we didn't. But our poor mother, she probably had some pretty agonizing times. <laughs> you think she worried about you? Oh, yeah. We had a good mother and a good father. And my father taught us all about all the flowers, all the trees. He knew every flower and every tree in this valley. Did you have a favorite 
flower? Yeah, in the early spring we'd go up the creek here and see the little yellow violet, which is a round-leafed yellow violet. Viola rotundifolio and the little hepatica. So he would take us up and show us all these things. Tell us what they were and tell us what was poisonous that we shouldn't mess with and what we could eat out of the woods. How did he know all that? Hmm? How did he know about all, all that? He was just a smart man and he, he grew up here. He was seven when they moved here. So he just grew up hearing about all the wonderful plants and wildlife and... Yeah, and we had a whole, he had a whole set of nature books too, which I still have. That's wonderful that your father gave you that gift. Yeah, he was a real smart man. He was a land surveyor. And if you go to the courthouse in Columbus, you'll see his name on gobs and gobs of plats down there. So he was also a surveyor. That must have been, that must have followed in your family, the, surve the, the surveyor. Oh um, yeah, my, my great grandfather was a surveyor. <clears throat> my grandfather was a surveyor. My father was a surveyor. My brother Giles was a surveyor. So who was your great grandfather? He was Giles William Pearson. You have pictures of him. Okay, so he's the first Giles. Yeah, you have pictures of him in that book in at Doreen Fields. Okay. So did you, um, did you ever see any snakes when y'all were down there at the falls? Were you ever worried about that or is that just... We weren't you? worried about it, but we saw them, mostly water snakes. Water snakes. Yeah, you could walk up that trail to the falls after you cross the bridge and look down in the creek and you could always see some water snakes lying out in the sun on the rocks. And we used to walk up and down the river and bang at them with sticks. <laughs> Water snakes aren't poisonous, are they? No. Okay, I figured you'd know. We didn't kill them, we just knocked them out of the trees. And sometimes they'd come running at us, swimming at us, and we did it ourselves. Okay. So now you, drove, you rode a school bus to Saluda. Is that how you got to school? Always. Always? So you had to travel up the grade. Which way did you go? Which way? We went mostly up and down the... In the morning they would come down the Pearson Falls Road and in the afternoon they'd come back down well, the same way. But we rode through the tunnel coming back home every day. It's hard to imagine that a school bus can fit through that tunnel. It came. <laughs> We had a school bus my whole school career. We never had to walk to school. We never had to walk to school. But we walked to Sunday school. Where did you go to uh, We church? went to Sunday school at uh, Episcopal Church in Saluda. And I used to, we didn't have very many pairs of shoes, but I had one fancy pair of shoes, Sunday shoes, and they made blisters on my heels. So I would walk barefoot to Saluda, and when I got to church, I'd put my shoes on. So you walked to church. Did you mm -hmm. also go Pearson Falls Road? No, we used to walk up uh, part way up the railroad, and then there was a trail that went up on a little creek that comes down by uh, what they call Cabbage Patch Road now. Mm -hmm. And we'd walk along there, and then we'd go out what they call Cabbage Patch Road, which was Parker Road at that time. And we'd go out through there and come out by the Mountain Home, which is now the Orchard Inn, and on the highway. We took all the shortcuts. Probably took you a while to get there, didn't it? <laughs> and I played basketball for four years. And I walked to a lot of basketball games. Played the whole game, walked back in the winter time. And usually we'd walk down the railroad and up because some people lived up on the railroad there and we'd pick them up to walk with us. Well, Saluda's always been known for having outstanding basketball teams. We had a good basketball team. Seems like I 
Maybe I've seen a picture of you. You probably have. Yeah, There's some pictures. Team. Seems like I've seen that picture. I think uh, Leon has some of them. Might, might be where I've seen it. Yeah. So who else? Who, who was on your team? Do you remember some of those? Martha, Ashley. Uh huh. That's probably where I've seen it. <laughs> Bet Betty played. Betty Thompson, Brown. Uh huh. <clears throat> Charity Henderson, my cousin Vera Pearson, Vera and Charity and I were the main uh, forwards. You know they played basketball different back then. The you, the forwards stayed on their end of the court. And the guards stayed on their end of the court. They didn't run through the whole court like they do now. I didn't know that. Yeah, they play more now like the boys do. Oh, okay. That's true. Huh. Yeah. Well, I've learned something today. Um, so do you have any fond memories of your days at Saluda School you'd like to share, like a favorite teacher or... Um, well, when I was in the sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher was uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Leonard, who lived at Tryon, Edna Leonard. And we had a history test, and she told us that the three people who made the best grades on the history test, they would take to Cherokee. And I had never been to Cherokee. So I made one of the three, and they took us to Cherokee. And it was really, really great trip. We walked across the swinging bridge, and we talked to the Indians, and we went to the school to see how the Indians went to school. It was a really wonderful trip. So I always remember that. And we used to go on field trips, too, which they don't do much up there now, I don't think. So we went to several different places and rode in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> they don't let you do that anymore, do they? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your best friend growing up? Well, because I couldn't get up to Saluda to different things that they had, I would spend the night with different friends. And Martha Ashley, Martha Coates Ashley, and I were good friends. Betty was a good friend. <clears throat> Betty used to have birthday parties every year for herself, and she'd invite all of us, and we'd go and have a birthday party with Betty. <clears throat> and then I had several other friends, too. Mary Frances Thompson, <clears throat> And I spent nights with all of them. I spent the night with Mary Frances once, and they had a cow, and she had to get up real early and milk the cow. <laughs> Didn't everybody have a cow back then? We off and on had a cow. Sounds like you enjoyed your time growing up in this area. Yeah, it was a wonderful place to grow up. What made you stay here? because I loved it so much. I spent eight years in Washington. Well, the eight years that I was away from here, I longed to be back. And when my father died, my mother was by herself. So I got a job in Asheville and moved back down here. And I was happy, happy, happy to be here. What makes Saluda and Melrose so special? Well, Melrose is the most special, this place, because it's been in our family so long. <clears throat> Do you just feel a, a deep sense of connection and roots? To here. To here. Because how long has your family been in this area? 1876, when my grandfather, Charles William Pearson, came up and surveyed for the railroad and he actually was the engineer who built the railroad. And Priscilla can tell you all about how they built it and everything. She knows more about it than I do. Okay, we'll get to that in just, just a second. I was gonna ask you about, um, you said the railroad was also your playground. So what did you do, what did you do on the railroad? That was we walked up and down the railroad, we picked wild strawberries. There were beautiful wild strawberries that grew on the 
railroad. We just wandered around everywhere. We climbed every mountain around here. And at Christmas time, because the kind of soil we have on this side of the valley doesn't grow pines because it's not acidic. It has sweet soil. And we would walk all over the mountain trying to find a Christmas tree. And we'd usually end up getting the top out of a hemlock because we had a lot of hemlocks that grow along the creek. But there were, but not pines, just mainly the hemlock mm -hmm. grew in this area. So, um, did you, do you ever remember trains coming off the, coming down the creek? Oh, grade? sure, a lot of them. I remember the one that, that you have pictures of that wrecked up at the number two safety track. And I walked up there with my father and saw that wreck. And then I saw several wrecks that came down the, went up our safety track and ended up at the end of the track in a gorge. They'd all go over the top and end up in the gorge. And the last one we had, I still lived over in the big house. I can't remember what year it was right now, but anyhow, that was the last wreck we had. And it was Stoker Coal had about 50 cars on it and it came down the mountain and I heard, I was sleeping in the upstairs over there and I heard it flying down the mountain and I knew it was going to wreck because it was coming so fast and it went up the safety track and turned, the engine turned over right at the beginning of the safety track and all that stoker coal fell down over the road and everywhere, but there were still some of the cars on the trestle that were still standing. But the others just kind of mushroomed together and kind of beat up together. It was amazing. Was anybody hurt in that one? No, I don't think so. They they jumped out up there. What you, do you remember? What year the safety tracks were were first put in? No, I've got it written down somewhere, but I don't, offhand, I don't remember it. But was our. Four year time? Was yeah, but. Time? Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. but. I, I just didn't know when they. Our grandfather oh. gave them land to put that on. So there are how many sets of safety tracks? Two? Two sets of safety tracks? Yeah, but. You live at the safe, this right here, safety track number. Yeah. One is yeah. safety tracks right here, number one. Yeah, and halfway to Saluda is the second, second one. Okay. Well, that's pretty fascinating. So you folks have grown up just with the railroad history all around you. Yeah, right? we had, had a lot of history to it. So um, y'all want to talk a little bit about Captain Pearson? Do you want to talk a little bit about Captain Pearson now? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, I'm going to fix the camera so now both of you all are now in the sights of the camera. So tell us a little bit about Captain Charles Pearson, one of Saluda's heroes. Well, he was a young man, fairly young when he received the, he worked for a company <clears throat> who was a construction company <clears throat> and he was also a land surveyor and they sent him up here and he surveyed and found the route and a lot of the politicians wanted to come up by Columbus where I-26 is but our grandfather told them that the land was unstable there and they shouldn't build the railroad there. So he found the route here up the mountain and it's a 7% grade all the way up, the steepest grade east of the Rockies, mainline grade. And he built the railroad. He actually was the engineer who did build the railroad 
from Tryon, from Spartanburg actually, to Saluda in Nashville. And he also built railroads over at Black Mountain, all that area over there later. And Priscilla can tell you more about the camp they had down here, base camp, You want to go ahead and tell us what? Well, I can tell you a little bit about Captain Pearson, too. He was a civil engineer. His uncle was Governor John Ellis, who started the Western Expansion for Railroads in North Carolina. He was the instigator of that. And so uh, he had the job of starting several railroads. He worked on several railroads before he did this one. He worked on one from Danville, he worked on one from, from Salisbury, he worked on one to Old Fort, and then later years after this one was built, he worked in Georgia and all the way to Florida and up in Virginia, building railroads. He was, when the, he had already finished one to Old Fort when the Civil War broke out and they had to stop. And so he resumed work when they got the funds again, the drafted bonds to build a railroad. And the North Carolina Assembly voted on it, and they started building the railroad again. Of course, funds were pretty meager in those years. So they did use convict labor, and they had a, an agreement with the state that if when the Railroad was finished and they didn't need the laborers anymore. They'd send the convicts back. They'd clothe them and feed them and send them back. Well, the railroad was so broke when it was finished that they couldn't do that. So actually his uncle, Richmond Pearson, loaned them f funds to help send the convicts back. And so that's how they got the convicts back. To Where did the convicts go? Back from, from the state, uh, they down, the, down the lower part of the state. I don't remember which prison they came from. But uh, I don't know. He he was involved in a lot of things in the state, and the family had been for years. Originally, the family came from Dinwiddie, Virginia, and that was Richmond Pearson. He didn't like the fact that his mother remarried after his father was killed. So he gathered up some slaves and a few people and came down to North Carolina along the Yadkin River and settled there in what's now Burke and Davis County. And they had, a, and eventually he had a huge plantation down there. And I'll have the pictures here of some of his children. And that's, she, his, Son Giles William Pearson married Elizabeth Ellis, the older sister of Governor Ellis. And Charles was their son. And he was in the in the Confederate Army Charles after the was, Civil Charles, War. Charles yeah. was. Mm -hmm. okay. Charles was. Mm -hmm. And he was in Virginia. And I have he's in the volumes they did of the Civil War too. They give a history of the North Carolina and the Civil War. He's mentioned, and I have excerpts from that and some of this material too. And he served first as a lieutenant and then later became a captain. And as I said, when he retired, um, when he came out of the Army, and they started the railroad up here again. He came and saw the valley, etc., etc. He'd seen it before, and they settled here. So he settled here because he just fell in love with the area. Fell in love and the, with the area. And how beautiful everything yeah, is Yeah, that's how our family came here. Because the Pearsons owned, owned a lot of land in Melrose on they the mountain. They loaned here, right? loaned, yeah, they loaned a lot of land here and they loaned a lot of land in the middle of the state. So, um, do you have you ever heard the kind of challenges that Captain Fe Pearson faced while trying to bring that those tracks up the grade? Um, I know he ran. There was a lot of uh, natural springs that he, you know, he had to maneuver around. And um, have you ever heard any details about? 
specific challenges he faced? I don't know about the challenges he faced exactly. So mainly it was the, st the steepness of the grade. The steepness the of the grade. Budget. Yeah, the steepness of the grade. And his budget. And the <laughs> fact that they had very few funds and the fact that they were riddled with disease at the times. They had, I saw a little notebook he kept. I don't have it anymore. It was in some of the family papers that were dispersed. He kept this little notebook and had what he called receipts or recipes for treatment for cholera. Okay, treatment of cholera. And other diseases. He also had a recipe to make nitroglycerin, which they used. They cut their own timber along the lines and made it cross ties. They had a quarry down on, between here and Trial the side of the railroad where they had that small rock cliff town where they quarried the stone and they had a crusher down there where they crushed up the stone and stuff but they had a hard time feeding those people clothing them and of course there would have been discipline and other other things going on accidents well I'm fascinated about the rock cliff shanty town mm -hmm. okay well I haven't I did there's some article I did for the uh, Pope, I did a speech for the Pope County Historical Society in that book they published, they published what I did, my, what I wrote about it. I did some work for Saluda during the centennial time. I wrote on articles about Saluda for the Thermal Belt News Journal. And I, I have a notebook with a collection of that and I've done articles on people like and sold to magazines like Phoebe Sullivan and Kundog Day. And I would love to read some of your articles. Okay. That's fine with me and I'm yeah. getting off the subject. Yeah, but, but Rock I was fascinated to learn to learn that Rock Cliff it, it was considered a shanty town, had its own zip code at one time. Yeah, they had a post office. And so that was what? About midway up the tracks between Melrose and Saluda? Where was this? You know where Twin Bridges are down there? Go up in there. It's a little bit below, isn't it, mm -hmm. A little bit below. Walk down the railroad and it's a little bit below right there. I wonder if you can tell yeah. where that everything was. You going. go up there, you can see where it was. And you can see that on in some of the rock, they still have some of the things that they nailed down in it to make holes and couldn't get them back out. They used hydraulics. And you can see some of the tin still there from the little shanties. They had a whole little settlement there yeah, because it took two place. years to build. So it was there about about two years. Is that the little shanty town was there about two years? or I think it took it more than two years. Than yeah. yeah. They eventually had a church. And the post they office. A number of houses. They, they had supposedly had a stockade down there. They called a pen where the convicts were housed at night. There were two places, I think. Of course, building a railroad, you had all kinds of people. They were the followers, the women who followed. And different people like that. It was like something you might see. Like you remember you see that show on TV, uh, PBS or someone, one kind of hell on wheels or something. It was probably quite similar to that. <laughs> yeah, it was. I bet that was some kind of place. Because it was a different time and everything was done by physical power, just, human power. There were, we didn't have all these wonderful machines that do everything for you. So you had to have they the had human use power. horses, mules, and men. So how far up the mountain do you think it is from Melrose that that, that was located? It's how, how down. Miles up? It's down the mountain toward Trump. Oh, it's that, okay, so I'm turning around. Wait a minute. So this was actually from Melrose towards Trump. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was going up the other way. Between Trump and Melrose. Uh-huh. Oh, it was down near the, the Twin Bridges? The Twin yeah. Bridges. Okay. Yeah, if you go down there now, you can see 
If you go in there, you can see the the granite rock. The whole mountain is granite rock, and you that's the rock the they used. It's still standing there above the railroad. Yeah. You can see it from where? Where exactly can from you? From the railroad. Oh, so if you're up on the rail, oh, you have to be up on the railroad tracks to see it, uh -huh. not from the twin bridges, but. Yeah. Okay. You come up the trail by the twin bridges and you get to the railroad and you go down just a very short way and there's a little trail that goes up on the right and that is the place. I wonder if you can. And it has a spring. Today. You can? Probably. It has a spring in there so they had water. Is that near that big, big waterfall? There's a waterfall over here. Melrose yeah. Falls. Is that Melrose Falls? Yeah. That big, big waterfall that you can see yeah. in the wintertime? Yeah. So I've been wondering what the name of that waterfall is. That's Melrose Falls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm learning a lot today. And all the cuts that they had to make, they had to cut through rock. And the big cut down here was called a uh, slaughter pen because they had so many wrecks there and so many people killed before they got the, the safety track built. So slaughter pen cut, that's where that big wreck was where all the cattle were killed. No, the cattle were killed up on the number two uh, safety track. Oh, okay. Because I went up there with my father to see that wreck. And that was where all those cattle were killed. That's, that's very interesting. I mean, you guys have really lived the railroad history right here from your own home. Yeah, because well, I guess our family's been involved in the railroad since the beginning of it. It was all part of the westward expansion, if you will. And so, your family has just shared stories with you, just passed down stories and oh, passed yeah. down stories. And, and mm -hmm. um, now you're doing that with your writing. You've been passing down mm -hmm. the history. And Millie, I'm sure you know you've, you've talked. I'm not the first person you've talked to, I'm sure, about this. And <laughs> no, I've run my mouth a lot. <laughs> well, you're proud of your family's heritage. Yeah. That's what it is. Well, yeah. And two, I've always been interested in history generally. So, yeah, that's too. Yeah, that's why. That's why we do what we. What, what we, we do. do what we yeah. do. <laughs> yeah, because I'll just digress a little bit. And just tell you that it was uh, my great grandfather was the one up there taking the pictures when the train came up the grade, and oh. he documented um, early Saluda. Uh -huh. Obi Garen. 1878. He was up there taking the photos when the train came up the grade, and the first time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he. I, 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 we're fairly certain he's what took that first photo of the of that July fourth, eighteen seventy eight. Mm -hmm. That we that he took that one. So, though I don't think that's from that. I doubt that. It's the right date. But anyway. well, I remember your grandfather then and your grandmother. The Stevensons. Yeah. Obi Garen was 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 Kathleen Stevenson's father, and he's the one that was the photographer and. Photograph. I remember Raymond. Mm -hmm. well, Kathleen. Kathleen taught me the piano at yeah. school <laughs> in the assembly. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that she could beat out a tune. Yes, she could. She was beating out a tune up until the day she died. <laughs> <laughs> she, she taught had a baby grand piano in her little. She assembly. taught me, I think, in the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. She was a cat bird. But this is about you all. So, what do you want to share? What do you want to share with us so that we can have this on record about the Pearson family? What Was there anything else you'd like to tell us about Captain Pearson or um, the family, family? Family history in general, family legend. Family legend. Yeah, legends yeah, always. Well, well, I can show you some stuff and I can tell you some things about the first Pearson. We have a record while well, it was Richmond Pearson. He was supposed to have been the youngest son of the Earl Richmond because <clears throat> because the young son didn't inherit a thing. The elder, everything went to the elder son, so and they he was in like in the Navy but he was a privateer. He had a plantation in Dinwiddie County, Virginia. He was killed boarding a French ship. 
His son was about was another Richmond Pearson was about 15 at the time. His mother remarried. I have pictures of the plantation and different stuff. His mother remarried. He didn't like the new father. So he gathered up what he could and went down to North down the Atkin River to North Carolina to what I said is Davy and Burke County now. He established himself there and became a very prominent citizen in those counties. In fact, his plantation covered what is now Davis and Burke County. And there's a cemetery down there where the Pearsons are buried, a little Pearsons Little Acre, where they're all, some of his children, he had two wives, and some of his children did various things in the government. One was a congressman, one was an attorney. And they were very active, all of them were very active in public life. One of his sons was established the first law school in North Carolina, and that's the second school he established was Richmond Hill up in Asheville, and that was and he was uh, ended up being a congressman, an ambassador to Italy and Persia that time, and he died in Asheville. He was one of Richmond's, second Richmond sons, Charles's uncle. Very prominent family. Yeah, and Giles, his other son, was an attorney. He was about 46 when he died. He died in 1847, leaving five children and his wife, his widow, who was Elizabeth Ellis, Governor Ellis's older sister. So, she, excuse me, Governor Ellis's mother was our great, my great, great grandmother. Very prompt, like I said, you have a very prominent family. Yeah. We're related to the Ellis's, we're related to the Shepherds from Alabama. Uh, one of our, one through the shepherds, we're related to one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. I can show you the documents and stuff. Which one? Oh, I can't remember his name all the you, you can tell me later. Can I wiggle? Wait just a minute. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'll tell you later his name. I can't, right now, I'm not thinking too well. Well, let me ask you a question. Where was Captain Pearson buried? Who, he's up in Friendship Church, Charlie. Friendship. Yeah, his wife and he were buried at Friendship Church. Pearson plots at Friendship Church. Which side um, is it on the up on the hill or uh, where? Over, is over on the other side of the road from the church. Not up on the hill, but it's right across from the church. Actually, up yeah, a little way. Right across, across from the church. Yeah, mm -hmm. right across from the church, sort of. A lot of our family is up there. So, how many children did Captain Pearson have? Five. Five. Yeah. And there was Ellis, Charles. Well, I just meant Ellis. E L L I S. Okay. Ellis. Charles. Charles. Fred. Giles, and Sophie. And there was a picture of them in that scrapbook, I believe, the family. Wasn't there a picture in that scrapbook of Probably. Cat mm -hmm. Pearson's children? Okay. But we're direct descendants of William Brewster who came over on the Mayflower. Oh, wow. Yeah. William Brewster. <laughs> you guys have got a very, very impressive lineage, family lineage, family, family heritage. You really do. You, you know, not everybody can claim to have, I mean, some, you know, multiple connections like that. Can I get even worse? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> One of our forebears. Descended from William Brewster and the Mayflower. <laughs> That's what she just said, yeah, yeah. yeah. But one of our forebears was... Uh, from his son, John. Scotland, in Scotland, William, what was his name? What? The Bruce, the Scotland. William Bruce, that's through the shepherds. <laughs> 
So are you guys uh, Scotch? Are you Scotch Irish? Is, are you primarily Scotch Irish? Uh, no, we don't have much Irish. Most are Scotch. The Pearsons were Normans. Norm, really? Huh. <laughs> the Bruce comes in through the Shepherds, through uh, Captain Pearson's wife, Susan Bruce Shepherd. She was a lovely lady. I have a picture of her. Okay. Well, what we'll do is, um, before we leave, I'll take my camera and I'll take some shots of, of these photographs. Uh, that's some of what he actually have. looked like when he was building the railroad without the, is that Captain, without the uniform. Is that, who is that? That's Charles Pearson. It is Captain Pearson. Okay. Uh -huh. I always think of him with his white beard. Hey, he was an old man then. He wasn't an old man when he built the railroad. He was a young man. Somebody in your family told me that you all have men. Men have, tend to get gray early. Is that true? Somebody in your family at that family reunion said the Pearsons tended to get gray hair early. I think it they was. They tend to gray. I think it was our cousins across the river. Their mother was a mower. And she got gray early, and all of her kids okay, got gray early. That's why they get gray early. Uh, but we, did, we didn't, no. Yeah. I'm 75, I'm say, you don't have any, gray. You don't, no, you don't. <laughs> but Captain the, Pearson was a handsome man, wasn't he? He was a very handsome man. Yeah. The house that they lived in stood here where my house is. And the rock that I have in the front in my fireplace came from the... That building. So we are sitting where Cat Pearson's yeah. house once stood. Yeah. It was right here. Right. It was built already when he bought the land in 1876, and he lived in it with his family, raised his family here. Our father was seven when they moved here, and my grandfather built. He bought this whole valley and all the mountain sides, and he built a lot of houses down here, which he rented to people. So is that the same, He bought. did he buy this land from the same people he bought the Pearson Falls land from? No, oh. grand, Grandpa didn't buy the land. It was two separate. The Pearson right. Falls. Okay. The Pearson Falls say, the Garden Club say, that our grandfather bought the land up there, but he didn't. It was our father. Grand, grandfather never owned it. Charles okay. never owned so it. So it was your father. I think yeah. you said that earlier. Okay. Mm -hmm. He didn't discover it either because I'm sure it was discovered long before. And there was there were lots of people still up at Fort Creek area and all around. Yeah, my family was here in the 1700s. Uh huh. So um, you know there were a lot of a lot of settlers that were in the area really early. So yeah, probably not. But well, the Cherokee Indians used to come down here way back to this valley in the summer and grow corn. And that, this was a, wasn't this like the where they would farm and hunt? They didn't live. They didn't somewhere. live here. They just came down from Cherokee. Yeah. Well, and when, some of them lived straggly out in the area. They didn't all live on reser reservation area. They lived all around. I mean, over on Green River where my mother and father moved. After I was gone, we found arrowheads and all kinds of things in those fields. They like river bottoms to camp at. Mm -hmm. The water supply. The water sense. supply and food and stuff. Jeremy, do you have questions? No? Just, just, you just listen. <laughs> you got more than you wanted. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't want him to feel like he couldn't ask any questions if he, if he had any. He's learning because he's going to try to do some of these on his own in the future so okay um is there anything else that you want to say about anything i've got some questions but if did you have anything else well i did grow up in saluda we lived on daddy built when i first when we moved from melrose and daddy built the house on greenville street he and my mother's brothers built actually physically built the house now, is that the one that's right off patterson yeah, you go, you know, there's a big white house that used to be the old Baptist Parsonage right there where you turn from Greenville Street mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. across from the Lauders. I think I know about what you're talking about. 
And then second, the next house was the house he built. And that's on the right or the left? It's on the, be on the left after you turn okay. on, on Patterson Street. Okay, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. And when we moved up there when I was almost six, for a year we lived at the falls at that house where Beth the Rent Wren Smith lives now. We rented it from Mrs. Wren. We were living in the house that Alice had. That was after the war. The war. And uh, when Dad, I remember Daddy coming home from the war and coming down that hill, and I didn't know him. He was a uh, Marine. <laughs> Stranger coming in the house. <laughs> and anyway, he built the house, and we moved up there. And I was almost five. I didn't get. I would have been six in November of that year, but I didn't get to go to school because the cutoff date was in October and they wouldn't let me. So I had to be, I was almost seven before I got to go to school. I went to school with Elizabeth Lauder and some of the, some of the other kids of that year. I graduated in 62. I remember seeing Phoebe Sullivan on the street in her white kerchief and an apron and walking up and down the street. And I remember Daddy worked in the hosiery mill down there, and Homer Taylor was supervisor, and I think, uh, or director, or whatever you want to call it, and I remember he would come and visit, he and Bertha would come and visit. Um, Mama and Dad, Mama was Baptist, and Daddy was Episcopalian, and I always joke and say they sent us down to the Methodist Church. So we used to walk down to the Methodist Church on Sunday and go to Sunday school and church, me and Linda, and my brother Giles was baby Jesus one Christmas. <laughs> Didn't turn out that way. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, went to school and I remember the people there. What year did you graduate from? 62. 62? Mm-hmm. So did you enjoy going to that school? I didn't know any other, so I guess I enjoyed it. <laughs> It's funny because a lot of the people that we've interviewed have really liked talking about their days at the Saluda School. They seemed, oh, yeah. Even though they didn't have any other experience, they knew that they were lucky to be able to go to a school like that. And I think yeah, even I guess now today so, because I, awesome I've never school. been to a big, you know, like a consolidated school like the kids go to now. It was, a, it was a very good school. It always has been. Amazingly, yeah. for a small town. Uh, Dolly Hall was my first grade teacher. Ruth Edwards taught me in the fifth grade. Maud Ashley taught me in the fourth grade. Do you remember who your principal was? Uh, Dr. Sawyer was still there for a while, and then, uh, what was his name? Mr. Michael. Oh, uh, different guy. I mean, a really nice guy. Uh, I can't remember right now. I'm having a memory lapse. I know. Doc Russell was a Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis. Yeah, okay. Davis. Okay. He was really a nice man. Okay. I used to work in the office for him, Mr. Davis. Well, so um, what do you think was what do you think was so special about growing up in Saluda? Well, I don't know. It's a small town. Everybody knew everybody, more or less, and, and all their business. <laughs> yeah, I have a sign <laughs> hanging in my house up here that says. What goes what uh, what goes around salute what what is it what goes around salute gets out in salute or something like that you know uh -huh. uh, it, it's like you know any, everybody knows what you do in salute you just yeah uh, everybody that's what I always always heard but anyway we used to cut through the alley by M A Pace's store that they've made the parking to now to go to school mm -hmm. and come back and we'd be playing and coming back from school and go into M.A. Paces and buy licorice whips and Kit Kats. And one time, I got always, I lagged around coming home so much, I got fussed at. And so, I had to, knew I had to go home. So, I, the train was there on the track, stopped. Well, I really got myself into trouble because I crawled under. <laughs> You weren't the only one. I've heard those stories before. Yeah. My dad talked about doing that and my aunt, so. Yeah. <laughs> did, did, did you get caught? 
Oh yeah, I got caught. Somebody <laughs> saw me and told my daddy right away. <laughs> oh my god. I'd you rather miss, have been late. <laughs> do you miss the railroad? Do you miss, do I miss do you, the railroad? I mean the train. Oh, yeah. you miss the train. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I can remember lying it. I mean the sound of a train at night is very soothing to me. A lot of people it irritates or you know. But it sounds good to me. Of course, like I said, when I was Got out of the hospital as a baby, that's where I was. That's what you heard. That's all you've ever known. Yeah. I'm sure you all miss that very much. I mean, I miss it coming up here because my whole life coming up here, I heard it. You know, I can hear it from my grandparents' house. Yeah. I miss it. It's a shame, too. It really is. It really is. A well, shame. when we were children, if we would be out in the yard and the train would start up the mountain, puffing real big, and it would throw up all these cinders. So we'd stand with our fingers, on, hands on top of our heads to keep the cinders in my hair. I always remember going down to the mailbox. My grandmother's mailbox was on Mount Fort Creek Road. Going down there and waving, you know, you could wave at the engineer when the old steam engine, well, even when the diesels came, but waving, oh, they always waved. And mm -hmm. Was it like, they, um, did, you, did you remember um, the engineer at the um, Patterson? Oh yeah, yeah, Mr. yeah. I think he always liked to. Yeah. Wait. My mother and father were married at their house. Oh. Yeah, my grandmother was married in their house. What house did they live in? Up on Patterson Street. On Patterson okay. Street in the uh, old Patterson house. Okay. Been there but that's on Patterson. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I need to yeah. I need to ride up there and see what see what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. okay. My mother worked for her. She kept house for her when she and Daddy got married, and they got married at Mrs. Patterson's house. And Daddy rented a little buggy and drove, them down, drove down to the depot in Saluda, and they got on the train and came to Melrose. <laughs> Somebody asked him, who was that little Italian, Italian girl he married? Because <laughs> she had dark hair. Um. Uh, you were going to tell me a little bit about Phoebe Sullivan. What well, so she, she was died. born in Lawrence County, South Carolina. Uh, she started working. She started working. She had this vision when she was a child. Uh, she saw these fish that talked and told her different things, and so she became a healer. She, thought she had some special powers that she could heal. And so she worked for a doctor in Lawrence County. I, I've got the story over there. but uh, And she healed a woman, of rise, supposedly healed a woman of a rising of the breast. It must have been a cyst or something. And then she got married and they moved up here. And she adopted all these children and had the church and following. She did a lot of faith healing and herbal healing, holistic, I guess. Did you ever go to her? You were probably too young. No, I didn't she go died. to her, no. She no. died in 56, so you yeah. were just, your parents probably wouldn't have let you go no, uh -uh. to her. But, um, but I can remember, and they used to have the celebrations and picnics and things up in Saluda. Did you go to those? No, I didn't go to those, but I knew they were there. Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about all the food that was yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Lola Ward helped me when I was riding. She talked to Phoebe's daughter or one of her relatives, and they, she wrote, they say she wrote a book, but what it basically was, well, you remember those little blue books we had in college that you did your exam yeah. essays in? What it was was one of those. She couldn't read nor write. She had memorized the Bible. And so um, she dictated her story to someone else who could write. And it was pencil, you know, it wasn't a published book or anything. It was just a handwritten blue book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. Seen she actually, I think, did at least two. Uh, yeah. Um, I've read the one of this, uh, the story of the fishes. Uh -huh. I've read that one, but there's another one. Um, Charlene's got it, and she can't find it. So, 
I've been after her for years to try to find it. Uh -huh. but, I worked uh, some with Charlene during the centennial mm -hmm. year. Yeah, Charlene is, is on our committee and normally it's with us, but I guess she just couldn't join us today. But, uh -huh. but did, So when you saw Phoebe Sullivan, what did you think? And did you ever talk to her? I, just, did you? I didn't talk to her, but I'm not going to tell you who told me this. I asked another schoolmate, I said, who is that lady? And she said, she's a witch. <laughs> well, so did you ever hear anybody say what was in those magic potions that she made up? No. Because you know she would have local boys yeah. gather herbs. Yeah. But she'd never let them gather like all the herbs for potions. So she might send some out for some She insight. made it up all herself. She yeah. made it up, but she never let anybody know the whole ingredients. But I heard the base, I've heard one time, I don't know how true this is, that the base was moonshine. Uh -huh. Her base was moonshine. And then she put her herbs in that. Mm, but I don't know how true uh -huh. that that is. But um, John, do you remember John Rhodes? Mm -hmm. He told yeah. me that um, that she, he, would, he used to work for the, he used to help with a phone company some, so he'd be working on lines and he could hear people talking, and he got on some phone conversations one time with, where he didn't mean to, but he was listening to Phoebe Sullivan's conversation, where she'd be prescribing these potions to various people from all over the country. Yeah, they had a lot of, had a huge following. Yeah, and so she'd mail that, those potions out uh -huh. to people all over the, the country. So he said she always had a great big old wad of cash. Uh huh. And Lloyd uh, Thompson told me the same thing. He said she he said she kept it up under her skirt, just all these all this money up under her skirt. Well, her she stock. had a very lucrative business. <laughs> she did. She's always fascinated me. I'd love to have known what some of those potions were. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, are there any other characters in Saluda that you can remember that you thought were just, when you think about Saluda folk or just interesting folks, is there anybody Well, else? we had the Fauntleroys. There was a judge and a doctor. And the judge used to come to our house over there all the time. Yeah, I remember Judge Fauntleroy. <laughs> and he, would wear, he wore a long black coat, winter and summer. And he would hitchhike. And it, whichever way the car happened to be going, he'd ride that way. But he'd come to our house, and my daddy would bring him in to eat with us. And he'd sit at the table, and I remember one time seeing him picking biscuits up and putting them down in his coat to take with him. But he always carried a big old sack, and it had all kinds of stuff in it that he had gotten out of people's garbage. He used to bring us rotten bananas. And during the war, he brought my sister silk stockings that were torn all to pieces that he'd gotten out of something. But he was a character. I heard, somebody told me that he, he had a chicken in his bag one time. Probably. He could have had anything. Yeah, yeah. He would be thumbing on the side of the road. Daddy, all, I guess, because he knew him and felt sorry for him. In fact, Daddy told him one time he hated it because he had to sleep with him one time down here. <laughs> Judge hadn't had a bath in many moons. <laughs> but he came once and he brought a, a chess board and chess figures. And he and my daddy sat out in the lawn out there and played chess. Well, he probably was a very, very intelligent man. Both of them were. Brilliant man. Both of them were brilliant people. Yeah. How about anyway, that? daddy would pick him up every time he saw him. I was just a little kid. I'd be in the back seat, and Daddy would stop and pick him up. And, of course, the judge sat in the back seat with me, and I would sit scrunched way over on the other side, pushed as far into the car as I could, <laughs> and he'd try to be friendly. I remember he pulled out this rotten banana out of his sack one time. I don't know why, but I was convinced their bag was full of big, huge spiders. <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> I was terrified of him. Yeah. A, a lot of people have said in their interviews that they were afraid of him. Mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid of him. I'm sure he was harmless. He would tease me and say, I saw that little red-headed boy behind the door kissing you. <laughs> He'd say, you want a banana, little girl? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, this might have been before your time, Millie, but a lot of people bring up Isaac Means. Did you ever remember he was a barber in town? Mm -hmm. Isaac Means? No, maybe he was before your time. He was married to Ada Means. I remember the name, that's all. Yeah. Okay. But our mother lived in Saluda when she was young, married, her, her, grand, her, her mother lived in Saluda and her father and she, mama was young and her mother took in washing for the people that came up for the summer in the hotels and things and she also had chickens and she sold eggs but at that time Saluda had a theater, had a post office, it had a bank it was a thriving city. It had all these buildings that were hotels that the summer people came in. But my mother paid for and bought land up Fort Creek and they moved up there and built, my grandfather built a house. And that came out of the window that he built. That was one of the windows from that house that my grandfather built. And when the Green River she had took over the place over there. They had to sell the house and everything. I've always thought that was sad when you hear about all those families that had to give up their homesteads or their homes and heritage and green. Well, that was all. Mother's family group. That was all over the mountains. Parts over there where they. That was all over the mountains the too. Shed. Yeah, you're right, Millie. A lot of areas in the mountains, and yeah. the Smoky Mountains and yeah. Blue Ridge. The People lived there. They had to give up. Yeah, to give up. Well, you know, they even had to give up their land for Biltmore. Have you ever yeah. heard a story yeah. about basically mm -hmm. they were at? Just like this mess down here that they cut all my trees down to put all those new power lines in. Oh, I hate that. I hate that when they do that. Yeah, they're going to put a culvert under there. And Eminent stuff. domain. You can't do anything domain. about it. Sounds like the railroads, eminent domain. And all my land is on un, on conservation easement. It is. Good and even you. though it was on conservation easement, they still were able to go in there and That's chop all my right. trees down. Who do you have your easement with? PAC. Okay. Good for doing that. Very but good. PAC has now joined up with the Henderson County Land Conservancy. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, just happened. Well, the Pearsons have always been good stewards of the land, from what, yep. from what I've always heard. Well, so is there anything, you know, before I leave, I'll take a look at the pictures and maybe take a few snapshots sure. of those. Um, is there anything else? Um, let's see, Jeremy, you got any questions came to mind? Only thing I want to state is the fact that the, my grandfather never owned the falls. My father your owned father it. father owned the fall. So you want to go on record and tell us once again, what is your father's name? Giles William Pearson. So he was the, uh, he owned the fall, mm -hmm. not your grandfather. Okay. Yeah, because I've heard a lot of different stories behind that. I've also heard stories that the Pearsons didn't even own it at all. Huh. What? Yeah, somebody said that the other day. I cannot remember. I can't remember, but it was, it was somebody just saying something in passing, but I thought, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not. Well, right. my father let, let all the people around here, all the locals. I know what it was, and they were probably, they were right. They were saying, Charles, Captain Pearson, didn't own the falls, and he didn't. It was no. your father. Yeah. That was what they were saying. So well, good. Were I'm glad somebody that's knows right. it. Correct that. Yeah. Correct that, so. So they probably did know the right story. Well, I've, to I've told those well, garden club people. Well, my cousins, Ella's uncle, Ella's children, think that he did. Think that Captain Pearson owned it? owned it, but he didn't. Okay. And it's sort of a myth perpetuated by the Tryon Garden Club. Well, I guess it sounded more impressive. Well, here's a question that I always ask folks in every interview that I do. So, what is your advice to people who will live in or visit Saluda in the future? What Do you have any advice for the, all these new folks that are evidently coming to town? Do you have any advice for them about Melrose or the Saluda area? I'd say try not to change it too much. 
They've already changed it too much. Especially Melrose. I don't want them changing it. But all these houses in Melrose now belong to the Pearsons. My sisters and brothers all came back and built houses and they all belong to the Pearsons. And now they don't because all these sisters and brothers, all my sisters and brothers are dead. And now all these different people own the houses here. It's not all Pearson anymore. It used to be a Pearson complex. No That's more. That's changing. Yeah, and I don't like uh, it. It does change. <laughs> we just have to go along because well, nothing else you changes. can do. Nothing else you can do. Well, we, you know, so many people have said, you came here because you liked it. So if you liked it so much, why do you want to change it? Yeah. And Charlene Pace loves to say, that road that brought you in here can take you out of here. <laughs> none That's I'm, her favorite saying. None of them ever leave, though. <laughs> they come and run everything. I know. I, I get you. I know how you feel. The locals get upset about it, and I don't blame them. Well, one of the reasons that I do this is because cause my family has deep, we have deep roots here. And because I want to get the story straight. Yeah. And I don't want yeah. them to be forgotten because what I'm seeing is it's great. It's people are muddying it. You know, they're not necessarily. People change things they change a little bit the to history. their particular situation or their own exactly. ideas. So I'm trying to interview as many people as possible. So you tell us. You tell us the truth, and it goes on record. Yeah. So that, and, or it's your, it's your personal version of it. Because one thing about it, I might ask you about Phoebe Sullivan, but somebody else is going to tell me something completely different. So you're going to tell me what you know about Phoebe, but it may yeah. be totally different what somebody else tells me. Yeah, I know. I'm like that, you. I've gone through. I mean, do try to do a pretty decent job of research. As best you can with, with what as you best have. I can with what's at hand. But there's nothing like getting that good information straight from a person who who probably knows, like you all know for sure about the Pearson family. Mm -hmm. So who better to ask? That's called from the horse's mouth. That's right. <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut this camera off because it's gotten hot. <laughs>